thank you everyone for tuning in. I know we'll have a few people um, coming in throughout the session. Um, my name is Kevin Underhill. I'm happy to be here hosting the fourth session from our FHC conference. So far, it's been going great, and I'm really looking forward to tonight's panel. Uh, today, we have an amazing lineup. We have Ali Baggett, who will be moderating today's discussion, and we have Thea, Coley, Scott Sanderson, and Ben Martin on the line. They'll get their uh, introductions done in earnest in a few minutes. Um, we also have on the line Field Hockey Canada conference staff, Haley Yap and Grace Lee. They'll be doing some tech support, monitoring the back end, the chat, and the participant list. So uh, thanks to Haley and Grace for being here. Uh, first off, I'd just like to do a land acknowledgement. I acknowledge that I'm presenting to you from, the, uh, from Vancouver, and uh, that's the traditional lands of Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh nations. I encourage all of you to do a land acknowledgement of your own wherever you're tuning in from. So thank you. Um, just a few housekeeping and logistic notes for everybody today. Uh, the session will take about an hour, um, perhaps a little bit longer. And uh, the format is a panel discussion moderated by Ali Baggett. Um, Ali is really the perfect person to be doing this. She's a sports communication specialist, a sports journalist, and an alumnus of the Women's National Field Hockey Team. So um, crosses all the um, areas. And uh, so yeah, perfect fit. So huge thank you to you, Ali, for being on for this. Um, for everybody else, please keep your mics muted and your cameras off unless otherwise specified by the hosts. Um, we recommend that you view this session in gallery mode. I was just talking with our presenters about this, but if you select the hide non-video uh, non participants box, then you'll just isolate our four um, superstars here. So that's the, what I recommend. If you have a question, we absolutely encourage it. So please feel free to write questions in at any point into the chat box and we'll feed them through to Allie. Um, and when she has a chance to get to them, she'll incorporate them. Uh, probably near the end of the session, but if there's some ultra relevant stuff, we'll try to get it in as we go along. Uh, at the end of the session, we'll be sending out an exit survey. And if you're using this session towards your NCCP professional development credits, please indicate that in the survey so we can get to you your points. And uh, yeah, lastly, just a thanks to our sponsors, Griffin Hockey, Osaka Hockey, and Frontline Medical Supply for all the support that they give us. That's it for me. I'm turning it over to Ali. Uh, thanks so much to all of you for being here for this. Uh, I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, like Kevin said, I am really excited to be here, um, especially with the three athletes that we have. I'm going to just quickly... Uh, uh, introduce them. So we'll start with uh, ladies first. So Thea Cully. Um, fortunately, uh, Thea and I go way back. We were teammates uh, provincially uh, with the Vikes and on the national team, junior and senior. So um, Thea, thanks for being here. Uh, Thea has 157 internationals, two Commonwealth Games, two Pan Am Games, two Pan Am Cups, um, and she scored so many goals. I don't even know how to count. Um, for me, most notably, uh, for Thea would be the bandana. She's like queen of the bandana and, uh, also her laugh. So that is what I know about Thea. Um, Thea, welcome. Uh, and can you just give us a brief, uh, title of what you're doing now? Sure. Um, I will try not to laugh too loudly into my microphone <laughs> um, because it will hurt your eardrums. Um, but I am now currently, I work at Deloitte. I'm a management consultant. I'm part of the human capital team. So I'm working on projects mostly around change management um, and tackling future work problems, which are plentiful now that we have COVID. Um, so that's what I'm working on these days. Awesome. And yeah, and Thea, um, formerly a board of director uh, for Field Hockey Canada as an athlete rep, so a really important position there, um, and board member of Athletes Can, another great organization in Canada. Um, so yeah, thanks for being here, Thea. Um, I'll move on, youngest to oldest. So Ben, uh, <laughs> um, Ben's from Vancouver. Uh, he's currently uh, tuning in or, or joining us from Boston, which is really exciting. Um, ben has 106 internationals played from 2009 to 2016. Highlight, obviously, the 2016 Olympic Games. And Ben is super, super smart. He, ha he defended his PhD in 2018 in biochemistry and molecular biology. And now he's doing research at Harvard Medical School. So whatever athletic accolades people have, I feel like we all bow down to Ben. So Ben, thanks for being here. And uh, tell us a little bit about what life's been like in Boston. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Ali. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, life in Boston this last year has been strange as it has been everywhere. Um, so it's been, I had about three months at home in my apartment. Um, and now I'm now I'm back in the lab and um, basically I'm a postdoctoral researcher. So I'm just going to the lab every day and studying how genes get turned on and off. Awesome. Thanks for being here, Ben. Um, and then we'll move over to the veteran of the group, uh, Scotty. Uh, Scott is um, from Mississauga, but he is uh, now on the West Coast in Vancouver. Um, we were trying to figure out the years that Scott played, and it's a little bit murky. So we're just going to say 1999-ish to 2012. Does that work, Scott? Yeah, I think that covers it. <laughs> um, Scott played in two uh, Commonwealth Games in 2002 and 2006. Um, he played in uh, two Pan American Games, uh, most notably the 2007 big win that qualified Canada for the Beijing Olympics, um, and Scott represented Canada there. Um, and then he came back for the Olympic qualifier in 2012. Scott is also a veteran of our indoor, indoor national team, so he played in two indoor World Cups, which is pretty awesome. Um, Scott, tell us three, three, oh, three. Yeah. Three. Yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. Didn't, um, didn't want to oversell you, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's all right. That's all right. Um, There's one that I probably shouldn't have played in, and that's that's the one that you're omitting. So that's just yeah, you doing yeah, a kindness to me. Yes. The last one in it. 2016 <laughs> or 15, I think I probably should have not played in. So that's was it a good place to travel to at least? Um, it was in Leipzig, where we played the first World Cup that ever happened. Um, so it was a bit of a coming back to a really good moment because we finished sixth there in 2003 and then we did not finish so well in um, 2015 so that was um, like I said maybe we should have left that one out. We'll just omit it yeah. Um, Scott tell everybody uh, what you're up to now in your your uh, work life. Yeah so I'm, I'm a full-time uh, fundraiser so I work for WWF Canada um, supporting their work on fighting climate change and biodiversity loss um, by helping people to understand what we do and, and find ways for them to contribute. So I'm the vice president of community giving. Awesome. Um, so yeah, three very different uh, professional backgrounds, uh, post-athletic career. Um, and before we get to that sort of life after hockey, um, I thought it'd be really cool to peek into sort of what life was like as an athlete. Um, Thea, you played for 10 years plus um, you know, as somebody who comes from a, a small town in Rosslyn, BC, um, what was it like uh, joining the national team? And then all of a sudden, like, that was your life? Well, I kind of, I mean, I kind of think it's like a frog boiling in water, if that's the right kind of term in that you just kind of, I just kept progressing through. It was like, okay, I'll make the provincial team and then I'll try out for the next team and then I'll try out for the next team. Um, and it wasn't just that easy. I got cut from every team I tried out for the first time. So like, it's not like it's just easy to make the national team. Um, I got cut a lot, but um, I do remember watching Andy Rushton play before I, like when I was a provincial athlete and um, they were playing Australia in this, in this series and watching her play, I was like, wow, like if this is the national team, like I don't know if I'll ever make it. Um, so that was, like a very standout moment and then um I think you know that first kind of tour making it for Canada um I played in Wales and it was kind of surreal I think I, I think I was like probably the right bit of naive at that point because I you know I went and I enjoyed the tournament or the the series and I actually scored a couple goals and didn't think anything of it. Um, and then like the rest of my career happened, which was like way harder. Um, but it was, you know, it, I, I'm pretty fortunate and, and pleased that I, I got to have those experiences and coming from a town of 3000 people, that's really a ski town. Um, I think it's pretty, people are always surprised that I got as far as I did. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I'm not surprised. And I think we had our first. I think we had our first cap together. And I yep. wasn't. Uh, I wasn't planning on playing. I didn't. You know, as a defender back then, you you didn't sub the defenders very often. And I remember yeah. finding out in 
in the team meeting that Andy Rushton had hurt her calf and I was starting and I, <laughs> I'm not sure, but I was, I was losing it. I didn't, I thought I was gonna be a bench warmer. I was just happy to be there. So yeah, um, totally. Yeah, I feel you. Um, ben, um, just wanted to ask you, you know, as B and I kind of talk about like Andy Rushton, did you uh, ever have somebody that you sort of um, looked up to on the men's national team and then all of a sudden they were your teammate? What was that experience besides like? Scott. Yeah, besides <laughs> yeah, Scott, besides I won't embarrass him. Um, <laughs> I, I remember when I was, I was probably like 14 or 15 and Shorty ran a, a summer camp in Vancouver. And so I think it was me and one friend at the time, Sean Ford, went and played in the summer camp and, and you know we're the two the two boys there's a bunch of girls with us and we played and I was so like in awe of Shorty because he's you know such a good player good coach charismatic and then it wasn't that many years it was probably like six seven years later um, that I made my first tour and Shorty because he was playing in Holland it wasn't like a lot of the national guys you see all the time like and you kind of grow up around but it was, it was definitely a eye-opening and um pretty surreal moment to be like, oh, there's Shorty, there's Kenny, these guys I've heard so much about, but hardly ever seen. Um, For sure. And it's just like a whirlwind of like, um, get, having that experience after that. Yeah. Um, Scott, uh, quick question for you around um, what it was like being based out of Ontario and how did that work with uh, being a part of the national team? Yeah, it was tough. It was tough, you know, like we, um, we needed to come out to Vancouver all the time. The, the training center was based in, in Vancouver. So, you know, if you wanted to play, um, you needed to make your way down here or, or over here. And um, we had a really strong group of, of Ontario athletes that would, would train together um, in, in Toronto. Um, and I, like, I, I learned a ton from those sessions, you know, talking about those, those older athletes and those more experienced ones that, you know, you kind of look around and you're, all of a sudden playing with um i had that same experience and had the opportunity to train with a lot of those guys that competed in the um the sydney olympics in 2000 so you know guys like um rob gabrio and um ken Pereira, harry kent um andrew griffiths like all based out of ontario and, and were training full-time um and so kind of rode their coattails and then you know then um realized that uh, I had to move out to Vancouver if I really wanted to make the team. Like the, the there was a new coach at the time um, when I was um, trying to decide what what my next move was going to be, um, and he said point blank to me like if you want to make the team you got to come out here, um, and so you know as I I was I was old enough then that I could make the decision and I you know um, emptied my bank account and with you know a few hundred bucks came came out to Vancouver and, and started my life out here um, and it worked out for me which was which was great but um, you know not everybody has that opportunity and not everybody can do that and so um, you know and that that exists today there's there's lots of guys and, and girls um, women who are, who are trying to make the national team whether it's in Ontario or another province who um, potentially have this skill set, um, but there's there's a lot of barriers in in their way. It's one of the challenges of of a country this size. It's like how do you how do you make it work? Um, and you you rely on those um, you know the the club system, the provincial system, and and hopefully being able to pick out a diamond in the rough and 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 find a way to to get them them out to Vancouver or in other places where where they can train and get exposure, but. Not not easy if you're um, if you're not from the left coast. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure uh, Thea, you weren't as far away, but uh, I'm sure you can share some insight in coming from a very very mm -hmm. small place. Yeah, and I mean, I I don't know if it's good or bad or it's just different, but like I was commuting off in from Rosslyn so I travel eight hours come down to Vancouver train for three to five hours go back to Rosslyn the next day um, and would do that even like in the summers when there was national team training um, so I mean I guess Scott's decision was made for him he had to move um, I had the like weird one foot in the door one foot out the door sometimes <laughs> <laughs> Um, you know, but one of, one of the interesting things that we were talking about kind of behind the scenes b before is, is that, um, you know, you make, you, you, these are choices, they're not sacrifices, you, you, you know, you know, you're not going to get paid to, to do it. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you want it, then, then it's, it's there. Um, and you can, 
you can find a way to, to make it work. And I think, um, you know, a lot of the guys from Ontario were actually really successful because they, they had to give up a lot and they knew what they were giving up and they couldn't have one foot in and one foot out. And so if we we're going to make the commitment to come out here and to do this, we were going to do it well. And, and so a lot of the guys, once they made that national team level, were, were there for a really long period of time. Yeah, no, that's really good insight. Um, so uh, thinking about your uh, experience as an athlete, your involvement in sport, kind of a question to whoever wants to answer. Um, what do you guys think you learned about yourself as, you know, from your experience as an athlete that you don't think you could have learned anywhere else outside of sport? Resilience for me. I mean, I mentioned that I've been cut from every team I've ever tried out for, but that that has served me well because life outside of sport is very similar. Like there's rejection all over the place and you, you know, you make, you make mistakes or you have little mini failures, however you want to word them learning. They're really learning opportunities, but if you don't have the resilience or the like understanding of yourself that, um, this is just a minor setback and that this is a learning opportunity and this will make me stronger moving forward. Um, like that's been huge for my transition from sport and, and even just now in my everyday life. So that's, yeah, for sure. And persistence, like just willing to continue to, to keep trying. Yeah. I, 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 I found something similar, like my, my path through sport. I think I was cut from every team before I made it and then sometimes cut and then had to make it again. Um, <laughs> I was thinking about like, you know, what, what have I, what, what has, what has sport brought me? Well, in science, like there's so much projection as well. Like you, you know, I'll spend months crafting this paper, send it off to a journal, three anonymous other scientists review it. And then I get their, their, their feedback. And it's often just brutal, like it's crushing. And I was like, well, the good thing is, is I've already gone through like crushing disappointments in sports <laughs> and worked through how to, get, how, to um, how to deal with that and how to kind of persevere and kind of pick yourself back up and just keep at it. Um, and that's actually helped me a lot in uh, my career as a scientist. I'll, I'll go a, a different road. I'll, I'll say um, something around, you know, building of soft skills and understanding how to uh, work with people and um, drive people towards a common goal. You know, there's, there's nothing like sport to have like a singular focus, right? You've got one thing, we're trying to win this game or we're trying to go to the Olympics or we're trying to be the best team in the world. And that, that singular focus is so easy to rally people around. Um, outside of that, in the real world, you're, it, it's, it's just so many more competing priorities, right? And so, sport allows you this opportunity to figure out like, okay, how do we shift things? How do we talk to people? What's the language that we use? What's the commonality that we find? What's the, you know, how do we create this, this empathy and understanding of, of treating people like the humans that they are, but also pushing them and driving them towards these amazing accomplishments and, and feats. So um, for me, that, that stands out as, as one of the most important skills that, that sports taught me and, and, and a, a thousand others, you know, like sport is this amazing tool that um, allows us to interact and, and it's a language of its own. Um, and, and I think the, the lessons that it can teach are, you know, countless. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you often don't know that there are lessons when they're happening, right? And you face them over and over. So that, you know, before we uh, transition into sort of talking about that life after your career, I just wanted really quickly, um, now that you're sort of on this end of your life journey, uh, and now that you know what you know about your experiences uh, as a national team athlete, uh, involvement in sport, if you could go back and talk to yourself when you were like, you know, at your peak uh, of your national team careers, um, what would you say to yourself? I'll start. Sure. Um, I'd say, um, well, you're pretty good. Like, you know, like don't, don't doubt yourself, you know, um, actually you're, you, you're doing some amazing things and, um, kind of back yourself and believe in yourself. And then, um, I would then lead in with, make sure you have some balance and, um, think about what else you need in, in your life to give you perspective and, um, and, and, 
you know, what that next step is, even though you, you don't need to know necessarily exactly what it is, um, preparing yourself for, for that um, and, and just getting some diversity of experience is, is really important. I mean, I, I think that's pretty similar. Um, what it brings to memory for me was when I actually did retire and, um, you know, all the, the nice notes that people send and, oh, you mean people actually did think that I was not bad at field hockey? <laughs> like, um, so I would agree. Like, I wish, I don't know, I think earlier in my career, I wish I had told myself or known a little bit more, um, like how to manage myself as a more professional athlete. I mean, I think you can only learn that through experience, but I wish that I could, like, I would tell myself now, like mentor myself through those beginning years um, so that I could maybe like speed up the development of some of those skills and understandings. Um, but, what do you mean by professional, Thea? Well, I would say like, because I like, I don't know. I just like, I don't know if I knew. I think by the end of my career, I had a lot better understanding of like what it would take and exactly how to prepare, exactly how to train, um, how like much more like how to perform, how to take care of those little details going into it. Um, you know, like early in my career, we didn't have the same support. So we we were left to our own devices for even just like weight training programs. You'd get given one, but it wasn't the same, you know, we're going to go and lift weights as a team and we're going to do this. And it, I think I would have really benefited from at least a little bit more handholding at the beginning. So just like mentoring myself through that of like, this is how you need to train to be like your absolute best. Yeah, because that preparation builds confidence, right? And when you're playing at the highest level, the thing that separates, you know, one player from the best player is is that self-belief, that yeah. that understanding of like, yeah, I can do this. I can, I can beat this player. Give me the ball and I'm going to go and do it. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, we spend so much time training our, our skills and, and, and the technical side of it, but maybe not enough time kind of um, on, on the mental side of it. Mm -hmm. Ben, anything you would say to your younger self? Yeah, I mean, I could clearly echo what Scott's saying about the doubt and the self-belief. Like, I think that would have been, um, especially when I was younger, I think there was a lot of, you know, fear of not succeeding and all the rest of it. I think when, when I was able to move past that and just play, it was always better. Um, and always, you have that little bit of self-belief. Um, I think the other thing, looking back on my career, it was always pulled in a lot. Like I, I was always very busy. Um, I think what I told myself to be more intentional in my time of kind of where I spent my time and how I applied myself to, um, I, I think when I was younger, I just said yes to, you know, everything I could. Um, and I think in hindsight, you know, now I've hopefully been a bit better about, uh, picking and choosing what I do and thinking a bit more about it. I think it's really comforting to hear you guys talk about that sort of self-belief because I think people on the outside probably think national team athletes are like, they know what they're doing. They've got it. You know, they've got all the supports in the world. So um, I thank you guys very much for uh, sharing that honestly, because I think it's um, really helpful for the young, young people to hear that and for coaches to hear that as well. Um, I'm going to ask mastering the game face, but really what's underneath it. <laughs> well, it's funny because you're, you're split, right? You've got dual personality because on, on one side, mm -hmm. you are this super confident. I'm awesome. I can do this, like whatever the challenge is. And on the other side, you're like this super fragile person. Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, it, it's really hard to get, get um, a balance between those, those mm -hmm. two perspectives. You're either one or the other. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Scott, I'm going to turn to you for this question because um, it's very fitting with your career. Um, you know, a lot of athletes we see retire, leave, come back. Um, and my question is really around, like, is it really ever as simple as just walking away? Um, as somebody who has stepped away and come back, what is that draw? Like, why, why does that happen? And, and how hard is it? Like, bring people into how hard it is to step away. 
Sure, yeah. So I've, I've um, stepped away and returned many a time. Um, so I, I guess I am kind of an authority on, on the subject. Um, and there's, I guess there's two things. So one is like what's pulling you away in the first place, right? So what's, what's taking you from, from this thing that you love and this, this excitement? And so for me, it was I, I, the first time um, was um, we didn't qualify for the Athens Olympics. And um, I ended up moving to Botswana and South Africa doing HIV AIDS education through sport for a year. I just, I, it was too much. I had put everything I had into qualifying for those games. I expected us to qualify for those games. We lost one no, nothing to Argentina in the Pan Am game final in 2003, didn't qualify. And so I was like left reeling and needed to get some balance in, in my life. So like at that point, I, I knew that I was probably going to come back. And actually I had this amazing experience and then had some doubt about whether I wanted to return or not. Thought about it, realized that actually my, my window for sport is really limited. And so um, I don't want to miss this. And I, and I want to take another crack at, at the Olympics. And so did that, we qualified for Beijing. Um, and then I was, I was playing in Spain at the time, loving that, had an amazing experience. And so it was like, okay, well, I can't like, the, the qualifier for the World Cup is just around the corner. And this is the thing about playing in this, that sort of environment. It's like, there's always one thing. There's this carrot that's just sitting there and it keeps you going and going and going. And, and it's awesome um, because it's, you know, there's something right there for you, but it is hard to step back and see, see the big picture. And so after 2010, I, I retired um, like officially because um, I was 31 um, at, at that point. And I was like, okay, like, if I, if I don't stop now, um, I'm, I'm going to be a forever hockey guy. And um, absolutely, there's nothing wrong with that. And, and I know I have lots of friends who have made very successful careers out of being a forever hockey person. Um, but that wasn't what I wanted to do. And so I, I knew that my, my options were getting closed and closed. And so I wanted to like try something different. And so I, I did that um, and, I, and I stopped and I, luckily I was living in England at the time and um, I still had an outlet to play. And so I was, um, I was really enjoying, you know, playing at a club level and I was, um, you know, uh, starting this new career of, of mine and then um, the, the men's team um, came up a little bit short in the, um, the qualifier in 2011, Pan Ams. Um, and, and Benny can talk about, uh, about that um, and, and what that meant for the team and, and the group at, at, at that point. Um, and so the, the coach at the time called me and said like, hey, I know you're still playing. Um, you know, we, we could use maybe some um, new energy to come in and try to help us to qualify to get to... Um, to get to the Olympics. And I feel like, you know, um, when the national team doing thinks that, you know, you can help their, their cause, you go, right? Like there's, to me, there's, there's no question there. Um, there's still a drive and a passion. You love the sport. And for me, it was also a chance to like, am I good enough still? You know, I'm a couple years older. Um, I haven't played at that level. I haven't trained at that level for a while. Like, what's this gonna be like? Am I gonna be terrible? Am I gonna be embarrassing? Um, am I going to be any use to the team? And, and so like a brand new challenge, right? It's like no longer about you in this world and, you know, you've got all this new perspective. And that's what I was saying before about like, what's the one thing you would tell yourself is like, get some diversity and perspective and experience so that you can pull in these things and see like, you know, how you can actually be the best version of, of yourself and what you can bring to the table. Um, yeah, no, that's, that's such a powerful insight into that that draw, that carrot and that, that desire to continue, but also to gain that other perspective is so important. Um, and hopefully it made you a better hockey player when you did come back. Yeah, um, in a lot of ways it did. And, and in some ways I was just a couple years older. So, you know, there's only so much <laughs> you can do. A little bit wiser, yeah. a little bit wiser. Um, Thea, if I think back to um, uh, 2015 Pan Am Games, um, I think a lot of people that are tuning in remember a very emotional and compelling interview that you gave. <laughs> um, it, was, it, was, it was a high and a low uh, emotional uh, roller coaster to the 2015 Pan Am Games uh, and the result that you guys had winning the first medal uh, for Canada on the women's side since 1999. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and then you retired uh, a year later. Yeah. So, I mean, 
Scott and Ben are both Olympians and mm -hmm. and for the women the story isn't quite the same so what where where's the the marker for you for when to retire you know <laughs> the, sometimes people retire on a high others maybe it's a low where did you fit in that scale I would say I was kind of high and low <laughs> the Pan Ams were a definite high um I was and still am so proud of that team and our accomplishments and um, just the the talent and drive, which has continued on. I mean, the squad is not all that much different for the women's side. And to see their tenacity and heart over these last four years since I've been playing, like it's, it just comes through in spades. So after after we didn't qualify, because that was our last chance to qualify for the 2016 games, I had already kind of thought that that would be the end of my road, but, you know, winning or doing well is a little bit addictive. And so I wasn't sure, you know, I didn't want to close doors just because I had said I was going to. And so I continued to play into 2016. Um, but what kind of became evident to me was that um, I don't think I had the same drive and determination to deal with the, you know, intense challenges and like emotional and like input that I was, that is required to be a high performance athlete. Um, you know, the, you have tough days at the office, as we say, um, and I wasn't feeling as resilient or as like willing to, to get through them in the same way. Um, and, you know, I have this very clear memory of being in San Diego um, in this beautiful hotel room that overlooked the bay and my roommate was Shan Lee and Shan Lee brings epic coffee that she hand grinds and that she puts into the AeroPress and that she makes you this like amazing coffee every morning. And so here I was like having Shan Lee make me amazing coffees. But all I could think about was that like, really, I, I would have rather been on the trip with my, at that point, fiance, now husband. Um, and, and, you know, we had a bit, we had some struggles on that tour. And I just wasn't feeling the same, like, drive to get through it. And so it kind of, as that year progressed, it just, it, more and more questions came in as to, you know, like, I, I feel like, I had this unfinished business, like I did not qualify for the Olympics. And so I had to start reckoning with, um, is it time to give up on the dream? Well, I'm not a quitter, but then, you know, you can't invest another four years of a journey that you're not enjoying because the outcome could be the same. You can't control Like There's so many things outside of your scope of control in qualifying for an Olympics. And the answer through like probably six months of very intense turmoil of what to do. And thank goodness I have great friends who are willing to listen to me. Um, but it was, it was, it was tough. And even when I decided to, actually retire I think it was probably another six months to a year of me like retired but like actually doing all the training program by myself <laughs> because I just wasn't sure you know like well what if I want to go back what if like I just it, it was a really hard decision and so like I kept training because I better stay fit just in case this was the wrong decision um so, um, you know, it, it's, it, it took, it, it, it was a long transition process. Um, and now being like a full quad cycle out, um, you know, you gain more perspective around how that whole transition period went and the, the phases of transitioning out of it. Like now I, I mean, I still like work out, but it's really more exercising. <laughs> it's, it's not training workouts. I think that's like when you start to like realize that about yourself. I think my husband's probably a lot happier because we have less fights when we exercise together because I'm not forcing him to train with me. And <laughs> he's like totally not like he likes exercise, but he does not want to train. Like that's not fun. Um, 
so yeah I guess that was it, it it's a long process yeah I think um you know <laughs> I, I I stepped away a lot earlier in my career and I remember um talking to Stephanie Dixon who's uh one of the most decorated Canadian Paralympic swimmers yeah. Yeah. Um, and she told me because I said oh you know like I feel like you're supposed to retire on a big high like a medal or or going to uh, you know big games and she said you know as somebody who had been to multiple Paralympics and won a ton of medals she said you know you are an Olympian what you give every day is what I give every day I just happen to be in a sport where I as an individual can can do that you you are each olympians um being on a team sport is so cutthroat to go after one of those medals um and one of those spots so i think um that really resonated with me and what you're saying um you know there's no way to sort of discredit everything that you have done has just been you know putting in the same amount as people who mm -hmm. all, who also go and win medals so um yeah i i'm always in admiration <laughs> of your career thea um <laughs> Ben, uh, speaking of highs, Ben, you were at uh, the 2016 Rio Olympics and stepped away after that. Um, I'm curious to know sort of what the hardest part of that decision was. And um, for supporters, so coaches, teammates, um, family, you know, what do you think that those people could do to help uh, a national team athlete or somebody transitioning away from a major part of their life? How could they have supported you? Yeah, I mean, I think for me, that was actually, at that point, I, I was pretty, I was, I'd been stretched and tired with studies and hockey. And that was a good point. Like, I was actually, I took a couple months to think about it after I finished. Um, and then the carding camp came up in November. And that's like a grind in the rain. <laughs> and I definitely knew at that point that I was, I was, I was done. <laughs> It was like, I, I needed to either register for the carding camp or retire, and it made it a very easy choice. <laughs> um, but in some ways, I, f I feel like I transitioned out twice, because I was actually cut from the program in 2011. And so I was told that, you know, basically, there's no, there wasn't a path forward for me. And so I, I spent about seven months where I, I went through that whole, you know, I played for Canada, but I haven't, I didn't feel like I succeeded. And I, I had come to terms with you know, that, that being it, that being my story and kind of moving on with my life. Um, and then a new coach came in, Anthony Ferry, and he invited me out to training again. And then, then the, the story changed. Um, but so kind of the, the last four years of my career felt like a gift. Like it felt like I was playing with house money in a way. Like I hadn't expected to get that chance again. And I was very lucky to get it. Um, and so then when I went on that, then I, when I did retire, it was like, okay, this was like a really special thing. I d didn't feel like I'd, expected to get or anything like that and so I think the second transition was a lot nicer than the first one yeah it's on uh, your I'm turn read. Uh, always makes a big difference mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm just going to read this question out from Jan because we all love Jan and uh, I think it's a really relevant question um did you guys think or prepare about uh sort of after your national team career while you were on the national team yes <laughs> I retired yes. and went to work <laughs> that day. Um, I worked full time for the last three years of my career and taking the, I mean, the, the athlete rep position at Field Hockey Canada was kind of just like happenstance. But once I was there, that got me to the board of Athletes Can and those were decisions that were made because they were opportunities and experiences that would I, I thought were going to, you know, help me in a flexible way so that you know provide me experience for a life after sport um and obviously like did my university degree um while playing go ahead ben yeah i mean so i started my phd in the in 2010 so for most of my career <laughs> i was doing my phd at ubc um which i actually found like Scott, when you're talking about having things like things like a diversity in your life and having things outside of hockey, I found that really helpful for me because if things weren't going well with hockey, I could go and do something that I cared about and just forget about it for, you know, six hours and just do science. Um, and when things didn't work in the lab, I could go and just play hockey and forget about. And so it kind of kept me balanced that way. Um, and I would say that, so yes, in a lot of ways I was thinking about life after, but I also, I wasn't, I'm not someone who really thinks about the future very much. And so I just kind of did it because I thought it was fun and I was excited by it. Um, and then 
things kind of more came into place after I retired from hockey and then started thinking about what I wanted to do with science. Yeah, interesting. Because for, you know, hearing both of you, uh, I was uh, just thinking like, oh, I wish I was more organized, like like <laughs> these guys were, uh, honestly. <laughs> Um, because the transition was, was a struggle for me. Like, honestly, I, I, I was not prepared well enough. I, I had, um, um, some, you know, decent work experience uh, and I had an idea of where I wanted to go by the time I was finished. But remember I played for a long time, right? So like there were periods in there where, um, I wasn't sure what the next thing was, or I was just trying to, you know, um, maybe do a little bit of consulting here or kind of keep my hand in something. Um, but there was a period where I was, you know, living in Spain and, um, for a good few years and, and playing over there and, um, learning Spanish and, you know, kind of, um, not, not doing a, a ton of career development. And when it came down to me retiring and then stepping into sort of the real world, I was, um, I think I mentioned before I was in, in England and, um, I had a British passport, so easy for me to work. And I was like, oh yeah, I've got this plan. I'm going to go over there. I'm going to do this, um, player control. So I'm going to get paid and make sure that my baseline is kind of covered, um, expenses. And then I'm going to start my career. And I knew that I wanted to work in the not-for-profit sector. I was like, you know what, it's going to be easy. I'm just going to go over there. There's tons of not-for-profits. I'm just going to, you know, find whatever, you know, um, actually no. I, I was like, yeah, you know, like I've got some good experience. I'm going to come in and sort of like this mid-level role and, you know, work my way up and whatever. And then um, quickly realized like, okay, um, getting zero interest. Nobody wanted to, you know, bring me in for an interview, put the bar a little bit lower. Okay. Just like get my foot in the door somewhere, start, and then, then it'll be good. Um, again, nothing. And um, in the end, I, I knocked on Right to Play's door um, and, and volunteered for them. And I, I was an intern for them unpaid for that, several months. And um, I think that, you know, it, I, I missed a massive opportunity to prepare myself for that transition and, and alleviate a lot of that pain by, um, by doing some more of these things, like that diversity of experience and, and trying my hand at a couple of things. Cause like, I thought I knew what I wanted to do, but I didn't really know a ton. And I think so often we're so laser focused on this one goal and, and com competing that we don't want to open up ourselves to these other experiences. And, and it's a miss because those other experiences, yeah, they're going to make you better on the field for one, like Benny said, you know, like just gives you that balance and, and perspective, but it's also going to allow you to understand what you do, or even more importantly, don't, what you don't want to do. And we just don't have enough of that. Um, people aren't thinking about that. And um, I think it's, it's um, I've, I've seen a lot of athletes kind of get to that point and you're used to being, you know, one of the top in the world in something. And now you're nowhere to be found and people don't have the time of day for you because you've got no work experience and like yeah you've got this great sports story but like if I don't care that much about sport then then I'm not not interested yeah and Scott even like yeah I planned but I've had the like same experiences that you're talking about where um I mean I started in sport, um, worked for karate and judo BC and then for sport BC, but knew that like I wanted to get into something else and trying to make a transition out of sport was the same, same thing. Like a lot of like rejection, good thing I'm resilient. <laughs> because, you know, so even if you plan, like it's still, you still have that, but, um, you know, I just kept on trying to draw on the experiences that sport provided. And yeah, I mean, I'm at Deloitte. There's, this is, I think like nine to 12,000 people in Canada work at Deloitte. Like I am literally a nobody <laughs> in this big, massive organization. Um, but, you know, surrounded by really fantastic and smart people. Um, so you know, I'm excited to be there now, but getting here was, was challenging and thank goodness for programs like game plan, um, that actually help athletes transition because that's how I got my foot in the door at, at Deloitte was that they have a partnership with the COC and we're willing to provide work experience opportunities. 
Yeah, I, I think the other thing is is um, like understanding how networking works mm -hmm. yeah. and how to take advantage of that. Like I had, you know, um, fairly personable person, so happy to chat to anybody. And so like would often be asked like, hey, do you want to go to this breakfast with this sponsor or whatever? Yeah, sure. Happy to do it. Like support the, you know, the program and, and whatever, but didn't realize that actually these were amazing contacts that I could have leveraged and said like, hey, I'm interested in getting some work experience in mm -hmm. your you know, industry. Um, what do you, what do you think? Is there some sort of program that we can set up? Like no clue. Right. So like mm -hmm. had these things like really looking back on it now kind of gifted to me and just didn't have the skill set or the knowledge to be able to leverage those. And I think that's something else that, yeah. you know, game plan and, and others are trying to figure out like, okay, like how do we actually prepare people for, for these things? And it's a specific skill set that, um, certainly wasn't, wasn't talked about before. Mm -hmm. What kind of um, like resources or specific things do you think would help um, not, not just national team athletes, but there's a lot of athletes at a variety of level who have to deal with, you know, moving on whether you're done a university career or, you know, just moving out of high school to not playing every day. Um, what kind of resources do you guys think uh, would be really helpful for athletes transitioning? <laughs> <laughs> someone's got something to say i don't know who that person was yeah. but I, I think it's really insightful um if i okay so i guess what i what i would say in terms of you know what what skills or, or what resources um what would i be looking for it's it's anything that's going to help you to think about um who you are and what what you're passionate about right so that that introspective um, look on, you know, who you are as a person and what connects with you, right? Like, I, I think anytime you go through a, a phase or a new, a new change in, in life, there's all this great opportunity that's out there because you've got a blank slate, but that's also really daunting, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, oh gosh, like, I don't, I don't know. I could do a billion things, um, but now I need to choose one. Like, I'm not sure what that's going to be. So thinking about what drives you, what you connect to, um, what inspires you and, um, and then talking to people who are doing those types of things, you know, um, I, I think just reaching out, you'd be surprised how many people are willing to take a conversation, have a coffee, whatever, and, and just chat with you. People inherently like helping others. And if you have an interest in something that someone is doing, then even better because it's like, oh, you're interested in what I do. Like I'm, you know, you know, just general Joe Schmo, right. But people actually, like we'll take the time for you and, and talk to you about what they do, what inspires them, their pathway. And then that might help you to learn a little bit more about um, what you might want or, or not. Yeah, that's really good, Scott. Um, you know, a lot of you, uh, a lot of national team players wouldn't have got to where they were um, without sort of that uh, intrinsic competitive drive. Um, a good question in the chat here is sort of like, where did you guys turn your attention to, to sort of release that competitive drive? Was it hockey at a different level? Was it another sport? Was it something else? Um, how are you satisfying that competitiveness in you? Ben, are you being a competitive scientist? <laughs> you should see all the blood in Ben's lab. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think, yeah, I mean, science, it's, it, there's a competitive nature to it. I think I channel it more as like, um, like, uh, I, w I want to learn new things. I want to discover, mm -hmm. make discoveries. And so I'm more competitive with myself. Um, mm -hmm. So I've, I, I think I've channeled that drive into science now. Um, I still play some hockey. Um, there's not a ton in Boston, but it's, it's, uh, it's more social. So I try not to let too much of my competitive side out on that front. Uh, and put it mostly into research. <laughs> <laughs> I um, I would agree. I've also more like it is the like drive to want to be the best that I can be as opposed to being like competitive against others. Um, and so, you know, that now that has just switched to, you know, doing the MBA and then and then now taking on a new career in a different industry. Um, I I'm not playing field hockey right now. I mean, COVID is a little bit different, but I did, I mean, I went to club training like the day I retired also. And I think I struggled a little bit to 
make the transition because of the like expectations that I put on myself of how I had to perform. Like I was putting pressure that I had to be national team Thea at every single club, everything. And then it kind of made it not fun. Um, and I didn't realize that it wasn't fun until I started playing. I played on an intramural like rec soccer team and I'm horrible at soccer. I'm offside all the time. I like, I don't, no, you know, I played when it was six aside when I was about seven years old. Like that's the last time I played competitive soccer, if you want to call it that. But um, what it made me realize is that I like I was giggling with a perma smile because I still have that innate love of running around and chasing a ball and that exhilaration of trying new things and seeing like how how can I get better at that like that I still loved it so I I do think I'll go back to playing field hockey but I think I realized like I probably needed just like a little bit of break so that I could let like let go a little bit more yeah and I I couldn't I kept playing Right. Like I just kept playing and playing, whether it was um, indoor or, or outdoor, like it was it was really hard for me to let let go. I just loved it so much. I still love it. You know, like it's mm -hmm. an amazing sport. Um, yeah. it, it, it is so fun to, to be out there running around, test yourself against others to try to put your team against the others. Like it's just it's it's wonderful, you know. And so um, I. I had to stop because, you know, there wasn't a ton of places for me to, to, to play um, any anymore when I was moved back to Toronto um, after I wrapped up my indoor career. But I, you know, played some other sport and um, channeled it into coaching. And then also, like like Ben was talking about, channeled into learning and self-development as, as well as my own kind of professional goals and, and really striving to, you know, in, in my case as a fundraiser, try to raise more funds so that there could be greater impact made um, for um, for kids or in my case now in the, in the environment. Um, and I know, I know we don't have a ton of time left. I just saw Sarah's question in, in the chat, um, about expecting athletes to commit to. Scott, you're doing my job now, but go I ahead. Know, continue, I know. Continue. I'm, I'm doing it. You can, you can fill in for me. Okay. Awesome. You are competitive <laughs> in every way. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I can't turn it off. It's just on all Scott, the time. you don't have to be the best host. <laughs> continue, continue. Um, yeah, but you know, like talking about athletes committing to being high performance um, earlier and earlier, and and how do we help them, you know, find that that balance? I think that's such an important question, and one that um, you know, when I when I see people setting out these high performance programs for really young athletes, I it really kind of. I have a strong um, reaction to it because I think it's the, the wrong thing to do. I think we need to create um, holistic programs, like whole athletes, right? Treat them in, in every aspect of growth that they need and, and professional development and personal development is, is one of them as well as athletic development. And um, you need to think about that, that whole person and creating time. And so if there's a big busy schedule, you have to, create priorities and, and make sure that you have enough time to do the things that you think are, are really important. And I'm telling you now, as you know, someone that competed for a long, long time, um, that balance helps you as an mm -hmm. athlete. And so make sure that you're, you're giving your, your athletes a chance to, to learn how to find that balance and whether it's, um, you know, I saw another question about mental health in there too. It's like, that's such a big thing, right? It's like balance those things together of, of like looking at the athlete in, in the whole side of things. It's not just about this one narrow thing about what you do on the field. It's, mm -hmm. it's all of it. Yeah. And trying different sports is like, you know, I did gymnastics, I played basketball, for sure those added to my like athletic development, but coming from a family where um, I'm actually the oddball, my, my family is all fine arts with drama, music, dance. Um, and so being exposed to like a totally different realm, um, you know, it, it helps know that like if it was just Thea the field hockey player and then that went away like that would be crushing um because that would have been my whole identity um so I definitely agree with you Scott like there needs to be something else yeah there needs and, to be a more holistic view 
the, the other thing that just makes me think of Thea is like, I remember when I, the hockey was the only thing that I had going on in my life. When I had a bad training session, my mm -hmm. life was terrible. Yeah. I, I, I like, it was so bad for like a couple days until that next training session that I could get out there and feel better about myself again. Like you, you need that perspective. You need that balance. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, I just wanted to ask you guys if, um, you know, if there was any instances in your professional careers now that sort of surprised you in a way that you're uh, going through all that, res those resilient moments uh, kind of like surprisingly prepared you for. Um, and I'm curious if you guys have any specific examples uh, in your work environments now. Around resilience particularly, or just like no. in sport things that have helped? Yeah, you know, maybe it was public speaking. Dealing with or... nerves like or per like performing under pressure um the ability to just like you know you get nervous and then just know like well that's my body preparing me to do battle and to be like the best in this next moment so for me like being comfortable with that uncomfortable performance feeling of like okay like this is where we're gonna have to dig down i'm just gonna have to put it like i know i'm ready like let's prepare we're going like game face on <laughs> and that's you know like that happened numerous times and yeah like public speaking or presenting in you know to a to a manager or whatever like it's it, that's definitely been helpful for me yeah I can think of um so one thing that in with hockey like with my career I'm a defender and we're playing off very good teams and I'm playing against you know I'm having to defend forwards who are undeniably much more talented than me like you know that you know I'm up against Jamie Dwyer he's obviously <laughs> so much better than me um so, but <laughs> <laughs> disagree um but you have to like I had to learn how to okay you know regardless of who they are you know in this moment I can I can win this moment and I can I, I deserve to be on the field and I can play and I trust my performance and all uh, my my preparation and all the rest of it and then um, actually, so now I'm doing my postdoc at Harvard and the interview process for that, I got flown out by the scientists who hired me. Um, and I have to give a seminar on my PhD research. And I go into this room and, um, there's two other scientists from Harvard who are there who are like, they've been in the field for forever. So they, they were like publishing in the eighties on, in my field. I've scientifically grown up reading their papers and one of them is quite combative. And so I thought this was a seminar where I talk for 45 minutes and I got a few questions at the end and five minutes in he interrupts me with like a very abrasive question basically challenging <laughs> what I'm doing and so it's kind of like that where okay here's a guy who is undeniably a much better scientist he's got this whole long history and he basically wanted to test me and so I was having to deal with questions for the whole hour and a bit um, and I think that's something where my sport background helped me handle that a lot better. Um, we're almost at time here, um, but I wanted to ask you guys one last question. Um, I wanted to know, give everybody a sense of what the relationships are like with the people that were your former teammates, because I think this is a unique side of it that a lot of people don't know. So give us really quickly a sense of the bonds that you made um, and what that looks like now. Yeah, for, for me, you know, those are some of the... Um, uh, best memories and, and best friendships that will, will continue, you know, for, for a long time. It's kind of interesting. Um, if, if you want to compare it to, to something, it, it's maybe similar to like, you know, being in university or, you know, end of high school, kind of, you, you've got these like really strong, intense friendships in, in a very specific window. Um, so you, you know, traveled around the world, you've um, done this specific thing. Um, for a few years with with people and had really strong shared experience and then you like split and you go your own direction and do your own thing and so um, you know I, I haven't spoken to Ben for a long time you know like I don't know five years maybe uh, or, or something but yet at the same time like I can like chat to him here and it's like no no time has has gone at all right like because you have that shared experience and you don't have to waste time doing the oh how are you doing everything okay whatever it's like straight back into what what matters and and the things that that you care about and um you know 
field hockey and, and sport at that level and that experience um, is is an amazing thing to bring people together. And I still see my best friends <laughs> from the team. They are my best friends. Um, so I have teammates that are the same as what Scott just mentioned, but I also, um, you know, Baker and I were running twice a week for the last two years. She's now had a child. Um, we were doing COVID friendly once a week kind of visits, trying to, to keep up with that. We're now not because of the cases, but, um, you know, she and Tyla and Sam Smith, like those are, and Mary Dickinson, like those are, that's my, those are my friends <laughs> like, now. Those are, those are my people. So it's, it's, you know, I, yeah, I, I just, I wouldn't be who I am without them. Yeah, and it's a small, incestuous little field hockey world, <laughs> right? That's 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 what we are. Like my my sister's um, partner yeah. is is you know played. It's temporary. He played on the team for you know. <laughs> if I played for a long time, he played for a long time times two. So you know, like um, it, it's just it's just one of the cool things. My, you know, my partner's a, a field hockey player, played on the national team, and and it's, it's just I don't know. You have this common bond that ties you together, and it's it's awesome. How about you, Ben? Yeah, it's the same. It's like so many of my best friends are with ho are through hockey, and um, yeah, and like growing up, and like it's such a small community, and so you know, like tops I played with at club when I was ten or eleven, um, and so you kind of yeah, I go back that far with a lot of them. Um, I think about half of the guys at Rio I played with at UBC, um, and so when I retired, most of them kept going, and so it's been you know, it's, it's always hard to step away. Um, but it's nice to see, like, it's been great because I've actually played, they've played really well since I retired. Clearly they're not missing me. <laughs> um, but, uh, they, it's, it's really, it's, it's really cool to see, you know, your best friends, um, still playing and I keep in touch with them. And I'd echo what Scott says, like some of them I haven't talked to in a few years, but if I run into them, it will be just, you know, just like it was. Awesome. Well, um, Thank you so much, Ben and Scott and Thea. I think this has been really, really powerful. Not that I'm competitive, but Kevin, I want to know the numbers of how many people tuned in and stayed the whole time because I feel <laughs> like, you know, we might have might have got the record. Um, but yeah, thank you guys so much for giving your time. Um, and uh, for those of you who we didn't get to the questions, uh, uh, we're sorry, but I'm sure these guys, you can, you can track them down somewhere on social media <laughs> and follow up with them. Um, but I'll turn it back over to Kevin to wrap us up. Thanks so much, Allie. And thanks to uh, Ben, Thea, and Scott. Um, awesome to listen to you talk. And um, it's so it's cool and refreshing to hear high performance athletes talk like openly and honestly about balance and retirement. And I love that last question about connection and community and friendship, because I know it's all um, for many people on the line, probably the majority of their social group and their connections is through the hockey community. So it's so um, it's cool to hear hear high performance athletes talk like that. Um, as an athlete myself, I found the whole thing today super inspirational. So I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. So just for everyone else for um, that's, that's it for tonight's session. We'll be archiving it. Uh, we have it recorded and we'll try to get all of the conference sessions up uh, before the new year and shared with all the registrants. So um, you can go back and, you know, watch, watch it all again. So uh, thank you very much to everyone. Uh, thanks to our, um, our panelists. And if you have a chance to fill out the exit survey, we'd really appreciate it. Um, have a great night and thank you again. Thank you. Thanks, thank everybody. You. Thanks, everyone.